Oh, it's quite all right. You're not disturbing me. I would much rather talk than work anyways. Yet, here I am, day after day, haunted by one thought. I must write, I must write, I must write. This is my study, the room in which I write my stories. I built it myself, actually. Cut the logs, fitted the timber, made an awful mess of it. I uh, do my writing at this side of the room because, well, the roof leaks over the desk, and I move the desk, but it covers a hole I left in the floor. <laughs> and the floor is built on the side of a hill, so in heavy rains, the whole room tends to slide downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Many's the day I've stood in this cabin and watched my neighbors pass me by on the road. Still, I'm happy here, although I don't get enough visitors to suit me. People tend to shy away from writers, saying that we're always busy thinking. Not true. Even my dear sweet mother doesn't like to disturb me. So she always tiptoes up here and leaves food outside my door. I haven't had a hot meal in years. <laughs> but I've done a good deal of writing here. Perhaps too much. I often look out the window and think life is passing me by at a furious rate, which causes me to ask myself the question, what voice is it that compels me to write so incessantly, day after day, page after page, story after story? Well, the answer is quite simple. I have to. I'm a writer. It's funny, but before you came into the theater tonight, I was thinking to myself, suppose I should give it up one day. What should I do instead? Well, ever since I was a small child, I always... I always... Excuse me just a moment. An idea just occurred to me. A subject for a short story. Ah, uh, yes. Now, what is it we were talking about? Oh, no matter. My mind is completely consumed with this new story. See if this appeals to you. It starts in a theater. It starts on the opening night of the new season. It starts with the arrival of all those dear and devoted patrons of the arts who wave and greet each other in the Grand Salon, commenting on how this one looks on how that one dresses, scarcely knowing which play they are about to see that evening, with the exception of one man, Ivan Ilyich Cherdyakov. If Ivan Ilyich Cherdyakov, a clerk, a civil servant in the Ministry of Public Parks, had any passion in life at all, it was the theater. He had hopes and ambitions for higher office, and dedicated his life to hard work, zeal, and patience. Still, he would not deny himself his one great pleasure, so he bought himself two tickets for the opening night performance of Rostov's The Bearded Countess. <laughs> Into the theater that night came his respected superior, General Mikhail Brasilhoff, the Minister of Public Parks himself. <laughs> Good evening, General. What? Oh, yes. Good evening. Permit me, sir. I'm Ivan Alich Cherikov. This is a great honor for me, sir. Yes. Like yourself, dear General, I too serve the Ministry of Public Parks. Which to just say, I serve you, who is indeed himself the Minister of Public Parks. I'm the Assistant <coughs> Chief Clerk in the Department of Trees and Bushes. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> Lots of lovely trees and bushes this time of year. Very nice. My wife would like very much to say hello, General. This is she, my wife, Madam Cherikov. <laughs> How do you do? My pleasure. My pleasure, General. <laughs> How do you do? Madam Brasilhoff, my wife, Madam Cherikov. How do you do, Madam Brasilhoff? How do you do? I just had the pleasure of meeting your husband. <laughs> and I am my wife's husband. How do you do, Madam Brasilhoff? <laughs> Shh. Sorry. My apologies. I hope you enjoy the play, sir. I will for sure <laughs> watch it. <laughs> Feeling quite pleased with himself for having made the most of this golden opportunity, Ivan Ilyich Cherdikov sat back to enjoy the bearded countess. <laughs> <laughs> he was no longer a stranger to the Minister of Public Parks. They had become, if one wanted to be quite generous about the matter, familiar with one another. But then, quite suddenly, like a bolt from a grey thundering sky, <laughs> Ivan Ilyich Cherdikov reared his head back and... I <laughs> 
Oh my goodness, I'm sorry, Your Excellency. I'm so terribly sorry. Never mind. <clears throat> it's all right. All right, it's certainly not all right. It's unpardonable. It was monstrous of me. She made too much of the matter. Let it rest. Let it rest? How could I let it rest? It was inexcusable. Permit me to wipe your neck, General. It's the least I can do. <laughs> Leave it be, it's all right, I say. But I splattered you, sir. Your complete head is splattered. It was an accident, I assure you. <laughs> but it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Terribly sorry. The thing is, Your Excellency, it came completely without warning. It was out of my nose before I could stifle it. <laughs> Certainly, I'm sorry. It's not cold. <laughs> That's what you're worrying about. Probably a particle of dust in the nostril. <laughs> But try as he might, Chernay Kamp could not put the incident out of mind. This sneeze, no more than an innocent anatomical accident, grew out of all proportions until it resembled the roar of a cannon aimed squarely at the enemy camp. He played the incident back in his mind, slowing the procedure down so he could view again in horror the infamous deed. <laughs> Somebody's tapping me. Who's that tapping me? Who's that tapping me? I'm tapping, sir. I'm the tapper. Cherikov. <laughs> Stand back, dear. It's the sneezer. No, no, it's all right. I'm all sneezed out. I was just concerned with your going out to the night air with the damp head. Oh, that? It was a trifle. A mere faux pas. Forget it, young man. Amusing play, didn't you think? Didn't you find it amusing? Amusing? Oh my goodness, yes. I haven't laughed as much in years. <laughs> what part did you say? It's a sneeze. <laughs> when I sneezed on you, sir, it was unforgivable. Forget it, young man. Come, my dear, it looks like rain. I don't want to get my head wet again. You shouldn't let people sneeze at you, dear. You are not to be sneezed at. <laughs> I'm ruined. Ruined. He'll have me fire from trees and bushes. He'll send me down to... Branches and twigs. <laughs> Come, Ivan. What? You mustn't let it concern you. It was just a harmless little sneeze. The general's probably forgotten all about it already. Do you really think so? No. I'm scared, Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> and so they walked home in despair. <laughs> Gift. Maybe some Turkish towels? Chernikov's once promising career had literally been blown away. <laughs> Why did this happen to me? Why did I go to the theater at all? Why did I sit about me with people our own class? They love sneezing on each other. <laughs> <laughs> Come and sit, Ivan. Perhaps if I call on the general and explain matters again, in such a charming, honest, and self effacing way, he'll have no choice but to forgive me. Maybe it's best not to remind. No, no, if I ever expect to become a gentleman, I must behave like one. And so the morning came. It just so happened that this was the day the general listened to petitions. And since there were 50 or 60 petitions ahead of Chernikov, he waited there for a morning until late, late afternoon. Non-violent act of God, and I cursed the torrents forwards up on my face. 
It's a hateful no, sir, and I'm not responsible for its indiscretions. Punish that which committed the crime, but absolve the innocent body behind it. I don't mind, though, no, sir, but forgive me your kindship. Forgive me. My dear young man, I'm not angry with your nose. I'm too busy to have time for your nasal problems. I suggest you go home and take a hot bath. Or a cold one. Take something, but don't bother me with this silly business again. Jibber, 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 that's all I've heard all day. Jibber, 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 jibber. Thank you, sir. Bless you and your wife and your household. May your days be sweet and may your nights be better than your days. The feeling of relief that came over Chernikov was enormous. May the birds sing at your window in the morning, and may the coffee in your cup be strong and hot. <laughs> the weight of the burden that was lifted seemed inestimable. I worship the chair that you sit on, and the uniform you wear that sits on the chair that I worship. He walked home, singing and whistling like a lark. <laughs> Life was surely a marvel, a joy, a heavenly paradise. Oh God, I'm happy. <laughs> and yet, and yet, when he arrived at home, he began to think, have I been the butt of some cruel and thoughtless joke? Had the minister toyed with him? If he had no intention of punishing me, why did he torment me so unmercifully? If the sneeze meant so little to the minister, why did he deliberately cause Chernikov to writhe in his bed? To twist in agony the entire night? Chernikov was furious. I am furious! He moaned <laughs> and fumed and paced through the night. And when the morning came, he called out to his wife, Sonia! Sonia! I have been humiliated. You, Yvonne, who would humiliate you? You're such a kind and generous person. Who? I'll tell you who. General Brasselhoff, the Minister of Public Parks. What did he do? The swine. I was humiliated in such a soft fashion. It was almost indiscernible. The man's cunning is equal to his cruelty. I was practically forced into his office to grovel and beg my knees. I was reduced to a dripping idiot. You were that reduced? I must go back and tell him what I think of him. The lower class must be gone, so the men of all nations and creeds, regardless of color or religion, are free to sneeze on their superiors. <laughs> it is he who will be humiliated by I. And so the next morning, Chernikov came to humiliate he. <laughs> Something so deep and vital 
was so organic that the damage that was done seemed irreparable. Something drained from him that can only be described as the life force itself. The matter was over. For once, for all, forever. What happened next was quite simple. Ivan Ilyich Chernikov arrived at home, removed his hat, lay down on the sofa, and died. <laughs> alternate ending for those of you who are offended by life's cruelty. <laughs> Ivan Ilyich Cherdekov arrived at home, removed his hat, lay down on the sofa, and inherited five million rubles! Yes! <laughs> There's not much point to it, but it is uplifting. <laughs> Next actress, please. Next actress, please. Hello. Name. What? Your name. Oh, Nina. Nina? Is that it? Just Nina? Yes, sir. Oh, no, sir. Nina Mikhailovna Zarechnaya. <laughs> age? My age? Yes, please. That means, how old are you? Well, how old are you looking for? Couldn't you answer the question simply, please? Well, yes, sir, but I just wanted you to know. I can be any age you want. 17, 38. In school, I played a 78 year old woman with rheumatism, and everyone said it was very believable. A 79 year old rheumatic woman told me so herself. Yes, but I'm not looking for a 78 year old woman with rheumatism. I'm looking for a 22 year old girl. Now, how old are you? Twenty-two, sir. <laughs> really? I would have guessed twenty-seven or twenty-eight. I have a bad head cold, sir. It makes me look older. Last year when I had influenza, the doctor thought I was thirty-nine. I promise I can look twenty-two when you need it, sir. Do you have a temperature? Yes, sir. A hundred and three. Good God! What are you doing walking around in the dead of winter with a hundred and three temperature? Go home, child. Go to bed. You can come back some other time. Oh no, please, sir! I waited six months to get this audition, and I waited three months to get on the six month waiting list. If they put me at the end of that waiting list again, I'll have to wait another six months, and then I'll be 23, and it'll be too late to be 22. Please just let me read, sir. I'm really feeling much better. I think I'm down to 101. I can see you have your heart set on being an actress. My heart, my soul, my very breath, the bones in my body, the blood in my veins. <laughs> yes, yes, we've had enough of your medical history. But what practical experience have you had? As what? Well, for example, the thing we're discussing, acting, how much acting experience have you had? You mean on a stage? That's as good a place as any. <laughs> well, I studied for three years under Madame Zolvienska. She teaches here in Moscow? No, in my high school in Odessa. But she was a very great actress herself. Here in Moscow? No, in Odessa. You were then, strictly speaking, an amateur? Yes, sir. In Moscow. But in Odessa, I'm a professional. <laughs> yes, that's all very well. But you see, we need a 22-year-old professional actress in Moscow. Odessa, although I grant you is a lovely city, theatrically speaking, is not Moscow. I would advise you to get more experience and take some aspirins. Please, sir. I walked four days to get here. I traveled all the way from Odessa. Won't you just hear me read? My dear child, I find this very embarrassing. Even if you did not employ me, just to read for you be a memory I would cherish my entire life. If I may be so bold, sir, I think you're one of the greatest living authors in all of Russia. Really? That's very kind of you. Perhaps we do have a few minutes. <laughs> I've read almost everything you've written. The articles, the stories. <laughs> I, I love the one about... <laughs> Oh dear God, every time I think about it, I can't control myself. <laughs> really? Wh which story is that? <laughs> the death of the government clerk. Oh God, I laughed for days. <laughs> death of a government I don't remember that. What was that about? Charity club? The sneeze? The sneezing splatter? <laughs>
Oh, yes, you found that funny, did you? Strange. I meant it to be said. Oh, God, it was said. <laughs> I cried for days. It was tragically funny. Was it really? And of everything you read, what was your favorite? My very favorite? Yes, what was it? Tolstoy's War and Peace. You asked me what my favorite was. Well, you're an honest little thing, aren't you? It's refreshing. Irritating. But refreshing. <laughs> Very well then, what are you going to read for me? I should like to read from the three sisters. Indeed. Which sister? All of them, if you have the time. All of them? Good heavens! Why don't you read the entire play while you're at it? Oh, thank you, sir! I know it all! <laughs> Act one, a drawing room in the Prozorov's house. It's midday, a bright sun is shining with a large <laughs> That's not necessary. <laughs> An excerpt will do nicely. Thank you. Yes, sir. I would like to do the last moment of the play. Good, good. That shouldn't take too long. Whenever you're ready. I've been ready for six months. Not counting the three months I waited to get on the six month waiting list. Please, <laughs> begin. Of course. <laughs> Certainly not. Why would I say such an idiotic thing? I don't know, sir. You wrote it. Chebykin says it at the end of the play. It would help me greatly if you just read that one line. Please, sir, I traveled four days to get here. I walked all the way from Odessa. All right, all right. Very well, then. Ready? Yes, sir. Tara Rabundie, sit on the curb I may. And Masha says... Oh, listen to that music. They're leaving us. One has gone for good, forever. And we are left alone to begin our lives over again. We must live. We must live. And Irina says, a time will come when we will know what all this is for, why there is all this suffering, and there will be no more mystery. But meanwhile, we must live. We must work, only work. Tomorrow I shall go into the school and give my whole life to those who need it. Now it is autumn, and soon winter will come and cover everything with snow. And I shall go on working. Working. Shall I finish? Please. And Olga says, the music plays so gaily, so valiantly, one wants to live. Oh my God, time will pass and we shall be gone forever. It will be forgotten. Our faces will be forgotten, our voices, and how many there were of us. But our sufferings will turn into joy for those who live after us. Happiness and peace will come to this earth, and they will remember kindly and bless those who are living now. Oh, my dear sisters, it seems as if just a little longer and we shall know why we live, why we suffer. If only we knew. If only we knew. Thank you, sir. That's all I wanted. You've made me very happy. God bless you, sir. Will someone go get her before she walks all the way back to Odessa? <laughs> <laughs> Come sooner and stay longer? 
have noticed it, madam. Only in these last three few years have I noticed it.
Semenich was the greatest seducer of other men's wives I've ever met. <laughs> he was successful with all women, for that matter. But there was a special challenge when it came to beautiful young women married to rich, prominent, successful husbands. I could never do him any justice, so I'll let him tell you in his own words. If I may say so myself, I am the greatest seducer of other men's wives that I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> I say this not boastfully, but as a matter of record, the staggering figures speak for themselves. <laughs> for those men interested, excuse me, in playing this highly satisfying yet often dangerous game, I urge you to take out pen, paper, and take notes. I will be explaining my methods. In defense, married women may do likewise, but it will do them little good if they happen to be the chosen victim. <laughs> My method has never failed. <laughs> now then, there are three vital characteristics needed. There are patience, more patience, and still more patience. Those who do not have the strength to wait and persist, I urge you to take up bicycling. Rowing, perhaps, seducing is not for you. <laughs> Now then, in order to seduce a man's wife, you must, and I repeat, must, keep as far away from her as possible. <laughs> Pay her practically no attention at all. Ignore her if you must. We will get to her through the husband. <laughs> you are about to witness a practical demonstration, for as it happens, I'm madly in love this week. <laughs> My heart pounds with excitement, knowing that she will walk through this very garden in a few moments with her husband. Every fiber of my being tells me to throw my arms around her and embrace her with all the passion in my heart. But observe how a master does his work. I shall be cool almost to the point of freezing. My heart of hearts and spouse approaches. <laughs> ah, Peter Seminich. Fancy meeting you here. My dear Nikolai, how good it is to see you. You're looking well. Notice how I'm not looking at her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And you, you gay devil, you're always looking well. Oh, excuse me, have you met my wife Irina? Oh, of course you have. You sit next to her at dinner at the Vesnovs. Irina, I don't know if this charmer said you at dinner, but I must warn you, he's a scoundrel, a notorious bachelor, and an exceptional swordsman. <laughs> That's the best I can say for you, Peter. You exaggerate, Nikki. Madam, good to see you again. You were just taking a stroll. If you're not busy, why don't you walk with us? That's very kind of unique, but as a matter of fact, I'm rooted to this spot. A new romance has just entered my life, and my legs are like pillars of granite. <laughs> Until she is on my sight, I will be incapable of any movement. Too much, do you think? <laughs> as I said, be patient. Fantastic. You never cease to amaze me. Pretty, I suppose. Suppose glorious. Suppose magnificent, and you'll suppose correctly. Any complications? As usual, a husband. I'm afraid my cause looks hopeless. Nonsense! <laughs> <laughs> I'm placing my money on you, Peter. And you know, I never bet unless I'm sure to win. Well, we're off. Good hunting, my boy. Good hunting. Madam. Beautifully done, don't you think? I'm sometimes awed by the work of a true professional. <laughs> Did you notice our eyes barely met? We exchanged hardly a word, yet how much she knows of me already. A, I'm a popular bachelor. B, a man in love. C, an exceptional swordsman. And D, most importantly, a dangerous man with the ladies. <laughs> Quite frankly, at this point, she's disgusted by me. A, because I'm a braggart and scoundrel. B, because I'm shamelessly frank as to my intentions, and C, she believes she's not the one I'm interested in. <laughs> For, forgive me if I'm slightly overcome by my own deviousness. <laughs> now then, next step, hypnosis. Not with the eyes, but with the poison of your tongue. Much like a venomous snake moving in for the kill. <laughs> and what's more, the best channel is the husband himself. Witness as I accidentally run into him one day at the club.
suit isn't going too well? Isn't that obvious, Nikki? I haven't seen her since I last met you and your dear wife. I sleep little, eat less. All my shirt collars have been taken in a half inch. Ah, Nikki. Nikki, why do I waste my valuable youth chasing women I can never truly call my own? How I envy you. Me? What's there about me that you envy? Why, your marriage, of course. A charming woman, your wife, let me tell you. Really? And what's there about her that amazes you so? <laughs> her grace, her quiet charm, everything. But mostly, it's the way she looks at you, Nikki. Oh, uh, how I wish someone look, would look at me like that. With such adoring, loving eyes, it must and quivers through your body. Quivers? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> uh, tingle, perhaps. Don't tell me you don't tingle when she looks at you. Of, of course. <laughs> By all means. I tingle all the time. <laughs> She's an ideal woman, Nikki. Believe that from a lonely bachelor, and me glad fate gave you a wife like that. Perhaps fate to be as kind to you. That's what I'm counting on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good heavens, I'm late for my doctor's appointment. What's he treating you for? Melancholia. <laughs> <laughs> Please, say hello to your beautiful wife, but I urge you not to repeat our conversation. It might embarrass her fragile sensitivities. Ah, uh, where, oh, where is the woman for me? I know where. <laughs> the question is, how soon will she be mine? There's still work to be done, but that task falls not to me, but to my aide and accomplice. Oh, by the way, I saw Peter Semyonich today. Oh, by the way, I saw Peter Semyonich today. <laughs> Peter Semyonich, the bachelor. We met in the gardens last week. An attractive fellow, you remember. I remember what a loathsome man he is. You may not think so when you hear what he had to say about you. Nothing that Bragger has to say would interest me. He spoke most enthusiastically about you. He was enraptured by your grace, your quiet charm. <laughs> and he seemed to feel you were capable of loving a man in some extraordinary way. It was something about your eyes and the way you looked so adoringly. He certainly had a lot to say about you. He went on and on. Well, good night, my dear. <laughs> Good night. What else? Huh? What else did he have to say about me? Peter? Whatever that loathsome man's name is. What else did Peter Semenich have to say about me? <laughs> well, that's more or less it. What I told you. But you said he went on and on. Well, he did. Bless you, stop. If he went on and on, then don't stop. <laughs> Either go on and on, or let's go to bed. Well, he said how much he envied me. How much he wanted someone to look at him the way you look at me. How does he know how I look at you? Well, that day in gardens, he must have been looking at you when you were looking at me. It sent a tingle to my whole body. <laughs> <laughs> the way I put you cute? Exactly, my precious. <laughs> Russian beauty. I 
asked that I knew just the woman, but dare not ask her myself. What do you think of asking your wife? Asking my wife what? To be the model, of course. With that lovely head of hers, it would be a shame if that exquisite face missed the chance to become immortalized for all the world. For all the world? <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you discuss it with her? Oh, that's a good idea. I'll discuss it with her. <laughs> well, I said I'd discuss it with you. What do you think? I think it's nonsense. I mean, how did he put it to you? Did he really say a typical Russian beauty? <laughs> Precisely. And maybe a sh shame if that exquisite face missed the chance to become immortalized for all the world. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> he gets carried away with his own voice. Those exact words, you need to leave anything out. Oh, yes. <laughs> that lovely face. I left out that lovely face. He said that a number of times, I think. He does go on, doesn't he? How many times did he say it? Once? Twice? What? <laughs> uh, let, let me think. It's hard to remember. It's not important, but in the future, I wish you'd write these things down. <laughs> Have you seen me near her? <laughs> Has any correspondence passed between us? <laughs> no, my dear pupils, and yet she hangs on my every word uttered by her husband. <laughs> awesome, isn't it? <laughs> we apply this treatment from two to three weeks. Her resistance is weakening, weakening, weakening. His mind is elsewhere, if you ask me. On oh, some woman from the looks of him. One woman isn't mentioned any woman in particular. <laughs> oh no, he's too discreet for that. He'll protect her good name at any cost. Instead, he talks of you all day. <laughs> oh, fool, I'm really starting to feel sorry for him. It's really none of our concern, Nikki. Did you invite him to dinner tomorrow? He says he's busy. The day after that. Busy? Next week, next month, when does the man eat? He says he's involved in a very important project. It's going to be months before we can see him. He did say, with patience and persistence, good things will come to him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, he thinks you should go on the stage. Me? On the stage? Why in heaven's name? <laughs> well, he said, Oh, hang on, I don't want to misquote him. No, no, take your time. Try to get it as accurately as possible. <laughs> ah, yes. He said, with such an attractive appearance, such intelligence, sensitiveness, it's a sin for her to be just a housewife. Oh, dear. He said that? And that. Ordinary demands don't exist for such women. Nikki, I don't think I want to hear any more. Natures like that should not be bound by time and space. Nikki, I implore you, please stop. And then he says, if I weren't so busy, I'd take her away from you. He said that? <laughs> yeah, right there. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you say? It's important I know what you said to him then. Well, I said, take her then. I'm not going to fight a duel over her. <laughs> <laughs> not to mention my name to him ever again. But I don't, my love. He's the one who always brings up the subject. He's actually accused me of not understanding you. He's shouted at me. She's an exceptional creature. Strong, seeking a way out. If I were Turganic, I would put her in a novel. The passionate angel, I would call it. <laughs> the man's weird. Definitely weird. <laughs> He's delivering my love letters, sealing them with kisses, and calls me weird. <laughs> now then, let's see what we have so far. The poor woman is definitely consumed with the passion to meet me. She believes I'm the only man who truly understands her. Her yawning, disinterested husband transmits my remarks, but it's my voice she hears. My words that sing in her heart. The sweet poison is doing its work. I am relentless. There's no room for mercy in the seducing business. Observe how deftly the final stroke is administered. 
For the faint of heart, I urge you, look away. <laughs> <laughs> no, Nikki, I don't want to hear another word from him. Nothing. What exactly? That's what he said. He begged me to tell you nothing. He said he knew because of your sweet, sympathetic nature, you would worry to hear of someone else's distress. He's in distress? <laughs> <laughs> Worse. He's gloomy, morose, morbid, <laughs> in the depths of despair. <laughs> but why? What's wrong with him? Loneliness. He says he has no relatives, no true friends, not a soul that understands him. But doesn't he know that I, we, understand him? <laughs> doesn't he know that I, we, appreciate him and commune with him daily? Doesn't he know that I, we, yearn to be with him, you and I? I tried to make that clear. I again urged him to come home to dinner with me. But he says he can't please people. He's so depressed he can't stay home. He paces in the public garden where he met him every night. What time? <laughs> and between eight and nine. Oh, um, by the way, we're invited to the Boskovex tomorrow. Is it okay with you? No. I'm visiting Aunt Sophia tomorrow. She's ill. I'll be there at nine. Or a little after. Please, please, no applause. <laughs> I couldn't have done it alone. I share that great honor with my aid and accomplice, her husband. <laughs> he wooed her so successfully that there's no carriage fast enough for her to be in my arms. She ran all the way. Observe. Now, for the conclusion. You will understand if I ask you to busy yourselves with your programs or such. This is a private moment, and I am, after all, a gentleman. <laughs> my dear, my sweet, dearest angel, at long last... No! Not a word, not a sound. Please, I couldn't bear it. Not until you've heard what's in my heart. For weeks now I've been in torment. You've used my husband as a clever and devious device to arouse my passions, which I freely admit have been lying dormant these past seven years. Whether you are sincere or not, you have awakened in me desires and longings I never dreamt were possible. You appeal to my vanity, and I succumb. You bestir my thoughts and untold pleasure, and I weaken. You attack my every vulnerability, and I surrender. I am here, Peter Semenich, if you want me. But let me add this. I love my husband dearly. He is not a passionate man, nor even remotely romantic. Our life together reaches neither the heights of ecstasy, nor the depths of anguish. We have an even marriage, moderate and comfortable. And in accepting this condition of his fully devoted love, I have been happy. I come to you now, knowing that once you take me in your arms, my life and my marriage with Nikki will be destroyed for all time. I am too weak and too selfish to make the decision. I rely on your strength of character. <laughs> <laughs> I beg of you not to use me as an amusement, but with that knowledge, I would not refuse you. The choice is yours, my dear Peter. If you want me, open your arms now, and I will come to you. If you love me, turn your back, and I will never see or speak to you again. The choice, my dearest, sweetest love of my life is yours. I await your decision. <laughs> God bless you, Peter Semenich. And may life bring you the happy news that you have just brought to me. Peter Semenich, the former seducer of other men's wives, from that day on turned his attentions to single, unmarried women only. Until one day, he found the perfect girl and the confirmed bachelor married at last. <laughs> he is today a completely happy man, except on those rare occasions when some dashing young officer tells him how attractive he finds his lovely young wife. <laughs> <laughs>
only creature capable of laughter. And it is that faculty that sets us apart from lower forms of life. Yet, one must wonder about this theory when we take into account the objects of our laughter. For example, pain. Pain is no laughing matter. Unless, of course, it is someone else who is doing the suffering. Oh, oh. oh what brings, Father? Oh, what brings you here? Oh, the pain is unbearable. It is beyond unbearable. <laughs> it is unendurable. <coughs> Where exactly is the pain? Where isn't it? Everywhere. It's not just my tooth. It's the whole side of my mouth. How many have you had this agony? Ten years. Ten years? Well, since yesterday morning, it's felt like ten years. Oh, I must have sinned terribly to deserve this. God must have chopped all of the business to punish me this way. Where is the doctor? The doctor is away on personal business, but he left the care of his patients in my young, capable hands. But are you a doctor? In every way except a degree. I'm a doctor to be. Then I'm a patient to be. Goodbye. I can assure you, the only thing that keeps me from being called a doctor is the formality of an examination. I'm skilled, I'm just not titled. Please, I beg you for this opportunity. Please, sit in the chair, Father. Oh, heaven help me today. Oh! Even sitting hurts. No doubt the nerves aren't playing. Once removed, the pain will cease to be. You're going to remove the nerves? The tooth that's connected to the nerves, that is. It's a simple matter of surgery. Oh, let's have a look. No. No. Ah! 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 Oh. Now let's have a look. I pray to you, I pray to the Lord and saints in heaven, spare me pain, be gentle with me. My dear Sexton, we are living, living in an age of advanced science. In skilled hands, there is no longer need for pain. If it's gentleness you want, it's gentleness you'll have. <laughs> now please, open your mouth so I can examine it. <laughs> My dear Sexton, inexperienced as I am, I know that it's essential that you open your mouth. It's mandatory to all work concerned them about to have it open first. It'd be highly impractical, impractical for you to pull your tooth from the outside. Now please open up. <laughs> Not just the lips, the entire mouth. I don't want to brush your teeth, I want to examine them. <laughs> Will you be gentle? Didn't I promise you I would? As a child, I was promised many things I never got. <laughs> <laughs> there is no pain connected to this part. This part is merely exa an examination to find out what, what must be done, where and how. Now, oh and I! Ah, yes, there we are. There's that little fellow. You're a nasty one, aren't you? Don't talk to it! Don't make friends with it! Pull it out! <laughs> Rush me. I'm a value. Oh, your tooth is a hole in it big enough to drive a horse and carriage through. What is it? It's even disgusting to look at. <laughs> <laughs> but if this is going to be my profession, I'm going to have to get used to these kinds of things. Now then, I'm going to try something. Be gentle. As though I were your own mother. My mother didn't like me. Gentle. <laughs> I want to see how exposed the nerve is. All I'm going to do is gently blow on your tooth. That's all, right? Excuse me. <laughs> uh, here we go. Ah! Oh! I have some news for you. The nerve is exposed. <laughs> is that how far science has advanced? Blowing on teeth? It's still inconclusive. More work must be done in the field. So much depends on the temperature of the doctor's breath. Ah, here we are. What are you going to do with those? The tooth has to be pulled. It'll be awkward and you can spit. Oh, merciful God! Surgery is nothing else. All a matter of a firm hand. I pray for you. May the Lord guide your soul. May he bless you with health and quickness. Mostly quickness. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This will come out easily. Some people give you trouble, I admit. But that's only when the roots are deep. I hope you pray for shallow roots. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't go my hand. Let go of my hand, I say. Are you going to let go of my hand? If you don't let go of my hand, I'm going to take these forceps and pull your ah. fingers out. Now, let's try this once more. Oh. There. Now it's important I get a gift from the hole so we don't break the ground. Oh. 
Now I got a firm grip of the monster. Now whatever I do, don't grab my hands. I'm gonna have trouble with you too without you interfering. Stay now when I say three. One. So three. Chill up your spine. 
Three intervals for individual performances. Special race for groups. Show starts in two minutes. I can't believe I'm actually discussing the price of admission to a drowning. <laughs> <laughs> missing the whole point here, sir. This is not some sort of cheap thrill. It's a rich tableau filled with social implications. A drama, not tragic, but ironical, in view of its comic features. Comic? What's comic about it? I puff my cheeks out and bulge my eyes. <laughs> yell for help in a high squeaky voice. <laughs> Sounds like a pig squealing. And I'm the only one on the waterfront who can do it. You expect me to pay to hear an underwater pig squealing? I just had a very successful scene, sir. Sold out in August. What do you say, sir? Would you like me to book you now for the dinner show? What do you mean, dinner show? Well, I jump in, flail around, and throw you a nice fish. <laughs> I hear the halibuts are right now, sir. Why do I stand here listening to this? <laughs> I wish you'd make up your mind soon, sir. In a few minutes, that restaurant over there throws this garbage in the water. Then it's messy. I have my pride. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about your pride? It doesn't prevent you from making a living imitating a deceased swimmer. You sure know how to strike at a man's moral points. That was cruel, sir. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be cruel. You completely overlooked the finer points to my profession. Look here. Ever see a coal miner at the end of the day? Soot in his nostrils, in his ears, black grit in his teeth. It's disgusting. <laughs> or a barber who comes home at night with the clippings of other people's hair sticking to his hands. Bread in his soup. It's nauseating. <laughs> Do you know where a surgeon puts his fingers? Where <laughs> a farmer is feet. Every man who works eventually touches something filthy. I, on the other hand, work with water. Water is wet. It's clean. It's purifying. I don't have to take a bath when I come home at night. I've already done it. Can you say the same, sir? Do you think I'm going to sit here and discuss my toilet habits with you? My god, you're infuriating! There must be a carriage around here somewhere. Cabby! Cabby! You'll regret it! You'll be back one night, bored to death. Dying to see a good drowning. <laughs> this is my last week here. I close on Sunday. Next week, I'm in Yalta. There's a police officer. Now, if you don't stop harassing me, I'll have you arrested for soliciting. I'm not soliciting. I'm in the maritime entertainment business. <laughs> Drowning is not maritime entertainment. You're a waterfront lunatic. Officer. <laughs> Officer. I'm going. I'm going. I'll tell you one thing. Drowning business isn't what it used to be. <laughs> Can I help you, sir? There's a man behind the docks. There. He's been pestering me all evening. I shouldn't be surprised if he were deranged. There's a lot of bad characters around these docks at night, sir. A gentleman like you should be wandering around here. What was he pestering you about? Well, I'm warning you, you're going to find this strange. He wanted to charge me three rubles to watch him drown. Can you imagine? Strange? That's outright thievery! <laughs> it's not worth more than 60 kopecks. <laughs> you can get as fine a drawing as you want to see and not pay a penny more. Get your money's worth. It's not a matter of price. There's two brothers on the next pier. One rule each, I'll give you a double drowning. You have to know how to bargain with these men, sir. <laughs> Officer, you seem to miss the point. Three rubles. By the other day, 14 men acted out an entire shipwreck for only three rubles. On a good day, for 10 rubles, you get an entire navy going down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. 60 kopecks. That's all I'd pay to see a good drowning. Stick to your price, sir, and have a nice evening. <laughs> it's come. It's finally come. The day the world's gone mad has arrived at last. <laughs> I see the officer's gone. What'd you tell him, sir? Tell him? I told him the truth. That you were mentally unbalanced. <laughs> Unfortunately, he was a little more mentally unbalanced than you. <laughs> Still, I appreciate you not causing me any trouble, and in gratitude, I'm reducing my price to an all-time low. Eighty kopecks. Eighty? Eighty kopecks? You conniving, wretched, deceiving little thief! I won't pay more than sixty. <laughs> sixty? 
60 kopecks for a drowning? Where's my profit? It cost me 40 kopecks for the towels. Another 40 for the guy who fishes me out. What's the point? I'd be losing money on it. I might as well stay under. <laughs> <laughs> you can't cheat me, sir. 60 kopecks for the drowning. Take it or leave it. Fine. You're a hard man, sir. Hard man. 60 kopecks it is. I pray to God my son doesn't want to be a drowner. <laughs> <laughs> 60. Now, where shall I stand? Right here on the edge of the dock, sir. That's where you'll see on the action. Are you sure I'll be able to see? <laughs> it's pretty dark down there. That's what makes it so eerie. The eerier, the more entertaining. All the actions last 10 seconds anyway. Well, here I go. Oh, um, almost got. When I come up for the third time, yell at the top of your lungs, Potnicheski! Potnicheski! Who's Potnicheski? He's the fellow who jumps in after me. Can't swim, sir. You can't swim? <laughs> you're telling me you're gonna drown without knowing how to swim? This makes it so exciting. Popnichevsky always waits to the very last second for jumping in and pulling me out. He's in that restaurant, sir, having a drink. Popnichevsky. Don't forget the name, sir. Well, here we go. If you like it, tell your friends. Eat the soup, as we say.
Well, there was no need to. My governesses never work on their birthdays, but I did work. But that's not the question, Julia. We're discussing financial matters now. I will, however, only count two holidays if you insist. Do you insist? I did work. <laughs> so you do insist. Go <laughs> ahead. Well, don't do then. Three holidays, therefore, we take off 12 rubles. Four days, little Kolya was sick and there were no lessons. But I gave lessons to Vanya. True, but I engaged you to teach two children, not one. Shall I pay you in full for only doing half the work? No, ma'am. We'll deduct it then. Now, for three days you had a toothache, and my husband gave your permission to not work after lunch. After four. I worked until four. I have here, did not work after lunch. We have lunch at one, and I finish at two. At four, correct? Yes, ma'am, but I... That's another seven rubles off. Seven and twelve <laughs> is nineteen. Subtract. <laughs> that comes to forty-one rubles, correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, I have here that you broke a teacup and a saucer. Just a saucer. What good is a teacup without a saucer? <laughs> That's two rooms off. The saucer was an heirloom, but let it go. I'm used to taking losses. Thank you, ma'am. Now then, on January 9th, Koya climbed a tree and tore his jacket. I forbid him to do so. But he didn't listen, did he? Time rubles. <laughs> January 9th, <laughs> your shoes are stolen. Buy them made. You just talk to yourself. But you get paid good money to watch everything. We discussed that in our first meeting. Perhaps you weren't listening that day, Julia. Were you listening that day? Or was your head in a cloud? Yes, ma'am. Yes, your head was in the cloud. No, ma'am, I was listening. Very well. We'll deduct it then. That's another five who was off. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. The 16th of January, I gave you ten rubles. You didn't. But I made a note of it. Why would I make a note of it if I didn't give it to you? I don't know, ma'am. That's not a satisfactory answer, Julia. Why would I make a note of giving you ten rubles if I did not, in fact, give it to you? Mm -hmm. No answer. Then I must have given it to you, mustn't I? You say so, ma'am. Well, certainly I <laughs> say so. That's the point of these little talks, to clear these matters up. Now we take 27 from 41. That leaves us with 14, correct? Yes, ma'am. What's this? Tears? Are you crying? Has something made you unhappy, Julia? Oh, please, <laughs> me. It, it pains me to see you like this. I'm so sensitive to tears. What is it? Only once since I've been here, I've been given any money. And that was by your husband. On my birthday, he gave me three rubles. Really? There's no note of it in my book. <laughs> I'll put it down now. Three rubles. Thank you for telling me. Sometimes I'm a little lax with my accounts. Always shortchanging myself. <laughs> <laughs> now then, we'll take three from fourteen. That leaves us with eleven. Do you wish to check my figures? There's no need to, ma'am. Then we're all settled. Here's your salary for two months. Eleven rubles. Count it. It's not necessary, ma'am. Come, come, let's keep the record straight. Count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's only ten rubles here, ma'am. Are you sure? Possibly you dropped one. Look on the floor, see if there's a coin there. I didn't drop any, ma'am. I'm quite sure. Well, it's not here on my desk, and I know I gave you eleven rubles. Look on the floor. It's okay, ma'am. Ten rubles will be fine. Well, keep the ten for now, and if we don't find it next month, we'll discuss it then. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Very kind, ma'am. Julia, come back here. Why did you thank me? For the money. For the money? But don't you realize what I've done? I've cheated you, robbed you. I have no such notes in my book. I made it whatever came into my mind. Instead of the 80 rubles which I owe you, I gave you only 10. I have actually stolen from you. And yet you thank me? Why? In the other places that I work, they didn't give me anything at all. Then they cheated you even worse than I did. I was only playing a little joke on you. A cruel lesson just to teach you. You're much too trusting, and in this world, that's very dangerous. I'm going to give you the entire 80 rubles. It's all ready for you in a Here. As you wish. Julia, is it possible to be so spineless? Why don't you cry out? Why don't you speak up? Why don't you protest against this cruel and unjust treatment? Is it possible to be so guileless? So innocent? So pardon me for being so blunt. 
Such a simpleton? Yes, ma'am. It's possible. <laughs> still offended by life's cruelty. Julia was so enraged by such unfair treatment that she quit her job on the spot and moved back home with her poor parents, where she inherited five million rubles! <laughs> it is my dream to one day write a collection of 37 short stories, all with that same ending. <laughs> I do love it, so... <laughs> Five months to recuperate. <laughs> what is it you 
you want from me? What rightfully belongs to my husband. His 24 rubles and 36 kopecks. They won't give it to me because I'm a woman. He can be princess. Some of them have laughed in my face, sir. Laughed! <laughs> None at all. However, madam, I don't wish to be unkind, but your petition, no matter how justified, has nothing to do with us. You'll have to go to the agency where your husband was employed. What do you mean? I've been to five agencies already and none of them will even listen to my petition. I'm about to lose my mind. The hair is coming out of my head. Look at my hair! By the fistful! Don't tell me you go to another agency! Please, madam, keep your hair in its proper place. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. This is a bank. A bank. We're in the banking business. We bank money. The funds that are brought here are banked by us. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? What are you saying? I'm saying that I can't help you. Are you saying you can't help me? I'm trying. I'm making headway. Can you not believe that my husband is sick? Here, here is a doctor's certificate. That's not it. Yes, that's not it. That's not it. <laughs> no. <laughs> there, there's the proof. Do you still doubt that my husband is suffering from a nervous disorder? Not only do I not doubt it, I would swear to it. <laughs> <laughs> you did look at it. It's really not necessary, madam. I know full well how your husband must be suffering. <laughs> <laughs> what? Why? If you won't even look at it. Look at it! <laughs> it says your husband is sick. It's right here on the doctor's certificate. Yes, madam, well, you certainly have a good case, but I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place. I'm getting excited. <laughs> you lied to me. I took you as a man of your word. You lied to me. I lied? When? When you said you read the doctor's certificate, you couldn't have, you couldn't have read the description of my husband's illness without seeing he was fired unjustly. Don't take advantage of me just because I am a weak, defenseless woman. Do me the simple courtesy of reading the doctor's certificate. Read it, then I'll go. But I already read it, madam. What's the point of reading something twice when I've already read it once? You didn't read it carefully. I read it in detail. Then you read it too fast. <laughs> read it slower. I don't have to read it slower. I'm a fast reader. Maybe you didn't <laughs> absorb it. Let it sink in this time. I absorbed it. It sank in. I could pass a test on what's written here. <laughs> but it doesn't make any difference because it has nothing to do with our bank. Did you read the part about what it says he has a nervous disorder? Read that part again and see if I'm wrong. <laughs> oh, yes, that part. It says right here your husband has a nervous disorder. My, my, how terrible. They can't help you now. Please go. Sorry, Your Excellency. I hope I didn't cause you any pain. No, no, no. Please don't kiss my foot. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get this in your balding head? If you would just realize that one of us with this sort of a claim is a stranger, you're trying to get a haircut in a butcher shop. You can't get a haircut in a butcher shop. Why would anyone go to a butcher shop for a haircut? Are you laughing at me? Laughing? I'm lucky I'm breathing. <laughs> Check in! Did I tell you I'm fasting? I've been in three days. I want to, but nothing stays down. I've had the same cup of coffee three times today. Put Jack in! I've taken the moment. I needed the least provocation. Watch! Did you see? Did you see how I just fainted? Eight times a day that happens! <laughs> You're as weak as a 
king of the jungle. You are a plague, madam. A plague that wipes out all that crosses your path. You're a raging river that wipes out bridges and stately homes. You're a wind that blows villages over mountains. It is women like you who drive men like me to conditions of husbands like yours. <laughs> <laughs> Get her, check in. Strike her. I give you permission to beat some sense in her. You hear? You hear of abuse? He would have you hit. An orphan mother. Hear my cough. Listen to this cough. <laughs> <laughs>